Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, first, just to check with you guys, is the audio okay? Can you guys hear me? Yes! yes. Awesome. Um, hi, guys. I'm Ali Feisinger, and I'm the news editor for The Voice. Um, and we had a question just, it's covering, um, in terms of covering news, how are you able to maintain an objective um, journalistic perspective in your stories despite close personal connections to victims? It's obviously really difficult because this is you know, what's going to happen to us as well. And like the people that we're interviewing are our friends and um, like our family, really. And so it's it's definitely difficult. But I think that when, when dealing with news stories, I think that Nikita and Christy, the two people that, that wrote the first story about the shooting, they did it really well. And you know, when you're writing news, I think that it's just really important to portray all different sides of the story, all different perspectives, and not let your biases cloud you from what's actually going on and obviously you know, the line has a certain position um, when we have a manifesto but that doesn't mean that anybody else in the school has less of a right to tell their opinions as, as we do so I think that what we try to do is, is portray as many opinions as we can and in doing so we're like we're remaining objective. Hi um, my name is Maya and I'm an outgoing managing and editor of Holly Voice um, and so you guys um, came out with um, a special edition that profiled 17 victims. Um, and what was the process of making that special edition like, and how has it been received? Okay, so I'm Nikita, I'm a copy editor at the Eagle Eye. Um, so basically, when we first started the memorial issue, it was very hard for all of us because some of the people that were in it, we had a personal connection to, and some of the people we just didn't know at all, which is like a different challenge altogether. So just interviewing friends and like family of the that or that passed away in the tragedy was um it was hard to find them it was hard to get them to agree to interview for some of them um those were some of our biggest challenges especially towards the end getting photos from them and photos on some of the big challenge yeah but like one of the most stressful things is like we had to make decisions perfect any sort of spelling mistake or anything like it would look really bad on us like we had to like Edit and edit whatever, like a million times to make sure everything came out perfectly. Um, hi, I'm Sonia. I'm one of the editors in chief of Voice. And my question is is that in the past, we've seen um, these movements for gun reform that come out of mass shootings and that they slowly lose steam over time. So, how are you guys planning on keeping this momentum going into the future? And how does journalism, student journalism, play a role in that? Uh, like more in the behind the scenes like of the movement march for our lives or whatever and uh what we've been doing like i mean initially we obviously wanted to keep the momentum going until march 24th and it was like a good date because it was like a month and a half after what happened and so it kind of gave the media like just enough time to kind of stay here the entire time and then now like we have our goal set for the midterm elections in november so i mean obviously we don't get the same media attention we did you know a month ago but uh, I mean, we're still in the news, and we're still trying our best to kind of be out there and get as much as much notice as we can to, to make a difference. As students, as in school, and also as you know, teenagers, is that uh, we're trying to put people to vote because a lot of us, like I'm a senior, Kevin's a senior, we're all old enough to vote now, and as our attention dies off, we need one um, in our community and with other people, young people, because what happens is our demographics are the lowest to turn out and vote, and we then complain about the people that are put in office and need to participate. So something we're trying to um, push now, we're trying to shift the attention to voting through that. Oh, and then I just had a quick follow-up, is that you guys mentioned that you were seniors, so how is this going to carry on when you graduate? And after you graduate. Well, not everybody, not everybody here um, is a senior. Um, I'm Miss Bukowski, um, <laughs> by the way, hi. But, um, you know, we have, there, the, some, of the, some of the kids that started the, you know, started the March for Our Lives movement um, are seniors, but there are others that are juniors. And on YouTube, we have kids that are um, freshmen and sophomores that are also, you know, going to be here, you know, for the next few years. So, while the seniors that are here are graduating, we have students who experience this event that are that are freshmen. The majority of the students that were killed with the shooting were freshmen. So the freshman class is, you know, deeply affected by what's happened, and those students are going to be here for another four years. And the staff, 
one of the teachers have been here for many years and are going to continue to be here. So I think that this, even though the school year is going to end, the focus here isn't necessarily going to transition away from that because we still have to come here every day and live it. And the freshman class is going to have to come here every day and live it until they graduate. Hello guys, uh, my name is Noah Ewan. I'm one of the outgoing editors, editors in chief of the Pally Voice. Um, so as a movement, you guys have received a lot of nationwide support, but also a lot of opposition from pro-gun advocacy groups. So as journalists, how do you deal with people who actively resent and oppose you guys? I mean, on social, I mean, on social media, like, we've received, like, we'll receive comments from people like, hateful comments and things like that, and also some of those comments like our website. Um, and so, I mean, for a lot of them, for the majority of them, we, we sort of just delete them and kind of move on because it's not always productive to engage in people, especially on the internet, because I feel like... 90% of them are trolls. Like, right. Honestly, they, and, don't, they, don't, they don't even, like, even if they, they do those things, they're just trying to, like, rile us up or, like, yeah. or, like, or just say stuff to, to make a way because they don't have anything better to do with their lives. They're yeah. open to hearing, you know, other perspectives and sitting down and talking to people and, and kind of, you know, it, it's for a lot of kids here, it's not a partisan issue, it's not a Republican or a Democrat issue, and so they don't care what party it is, you know, is going to support them as long as they make headway on this issue. As, as student journalists, uh, you have this platform to reach out to the community. How are you giving a voice to students who aren't journalists? Um, well, like we just said, we're doing guest editorials. Um, you know, throughout this whole thing, we've been interviews and allowing people that didn't feel like their voices have been heard to come to the newspaper room and tell us their story um, so we can share it with the world. Um, you know, what? We have a Humans of MSD account on Instagram, which, well, and, um, <laughs> and it's it's a compilation of different people's stories. Let us see. Um, and there also are something that we put in issue, which are um, pieces that the students have, like, 100 to 250 words that the students are allowed to submit to our paper and um, I'm Maya, and I'm an outgoing editor-in-chief for the Pally Voice. Um, so just like looking through your site, you guys still manage to maintain a really healthy balance of diverse stories, and I was just wondering how you guys cover, like, can cover what seems so trivial in light of such like a big issue. We're still, yeah, we're still, we're still a news, um, a newspaper. We're still a class. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think that it also, you know, we were in the middle of writing our third quarter issue when this happened, um, and we have to, you know, take all of that away and start our uh, um, the memorial issue. And I think that we, what we try to do is create a balance again, like you said, like a balance of obviously these devastating stories and, and the stories that are related to this awful thing that happened to us, and and also stories that are like music reviews and and and, and things that are maybe a little bit. Um, I'm related to that because it's important. You can't, on a little personal note, like you can't like stab in our lives yeah. with, with just this and this and this and this all the time because. And then, like Emma said earlier, there are students who aren't ready to write things that are related to it. Um, so we have students. We have two periods of newspaper, and fourth period newspaper was with us that day. But eighth period newspaper, those kids were all over the place in their various fourth period classes, and some of those were in the 1200 room. So you have students that experienced, um, that experienced the shooting, like who are newspaper staff, and they're not necessarily ready to write. They weren't ready to write a memorial story about a student or, or a teacher that passed away. They want to do something that is a little bit lighter or. Um, something else so that they don't have to think about it. Hi guys. Um, I'm Sophia. I'm a staff writer for the Pally Voice. Um, so I have a little bit more, like, a different question. It's more generally about Parkland as a community. So, um, Palo Alto and Parkland are similar um, in that they are both pretty privileged communities, uh, though they're very different in terms of levels of student activism. Uh, so, did the resources available to Parkland as a wealthy town contribute to the success of the Never Again movement? And um, how can Palo Alto students uh, who want to get involved but don't necessarily know how to use our resources like you guys did uh, to further the movement? Um, yeah, so I guess uh, in, in many ways it's similar to like the people who did come out like first with, like, with the march and everything. They, did have parents and stuff who were more well connected due to, you know, 
Parkland status or whatever, <laughs> Parkland. that they get a Parkland. Um, but I mean, there's also people like Emma who literally just spoke out at a rally where anyone was allowed to speak, and she was so passionate and everything, now she's like the most famous teenager in the country, so. Yeah, I think it was, it's not, it's not, like, sure, we had resources that were available to us, but at the same time, it was the attention we had on us. Um, yeah. We also have social media, and so, like, um, in, in previous events and strategies like this, um, we didn't have things like Twitter or Facebook or all that, so now things spread like a wildfire. Like, the people yeah. knew about the shooting on Twitter or something like that, so it's really, the resources, the internet, the resources, the attention is not really what people have given us to, like, um, I'd say for you guys, like get involved in whatever you can. Get your voice. Use like the powerhouse that is social media. Like reach out to your congressman. Uh, of them have like programs. Like I'm in a program with Ted Deutsch called like the Congressional Youth Cabinet. Like a lot of congressmen have things like that where you can get involved and in learn about politics. Hi, I'm Paul Kandel, advisor to the Cali Voice. And, uh, Hi. 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 Um, we're about to transition to a new class, so we're going to have to say goodbye, but I did want to take a moment to say thank you for making the time for us. Thank you for your bravery and for your articulate, clear-headed thinking. We're so grateful that you took time to talk with us, and uh, we hope that uh, you will keep going. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye.